Thank you very much, Steve. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the energy challenge that's upon us um, and the role that exploration geoscience is playing and will play in tackling that challenge. In order to highlight the current predicament, though, what I'm first going to do is to provide some historical perspective and context. Uh, what I'll do is to describe the energy crisis that took place and affected the country 40 years ago in the 1970s. And what I'll then do is go on to describe how the discovery of oil and gas within the North Sea on the UK continental shelf helped exceed our energy needs for the best part of 25 years. But since 1999, oil and gas production has been in decline, and very sharply so in the last decade. And there is now a, a major challenge on our hands. So what I'm going to do is take you through each of these issues. I'll start with the historical and geological context. I'll take us back to the energy crisis of the early 1970s. Talk about the impact of the UKCS, that's the United Kingdom Continental Shelf's oil and gas reserves. The current challenge that the UK faces and try and place it, at least briefly, into a global context. And then finish with Herrick Watt's vital role in research and training. Uh, in this regard. So, I've deliberately cut off this slide. Uh, you'll see more of it later. But this simply shows the fossil fuel dependence that we had here in the UK. Uh, really, it, between 1965 and uh, the early 70s. So, in here what we see is a breakdown of different um, sources of energy. Coal, you can see, made up uh, half or perhaps slightly over half of our energy needs in the early 70s, late 60s and early 70s. Oil made up the majority of the rest. So it's actually over 90% of our energy needs were made up at that time by fossil fuels. We were entirely dependent on them. And then uh, what happened in the early 70s, as some of us, Steve perhaps, will remember, is uh, we had rampant inflation and uh, the unions were strong. They were unhappy when there was a cap on public wage increases. And industry was, was in um, really in crisis in terms of the, the settlement of pay. And one of the areas in, in this country that was affected were the coal mines. There was a coal mine strike, not the one that many of you will become um, will be more aware of in the 1980s, but one precursor to that. And the, the coal mine strike led to um, a, a diminishing supply and resource of, of coal stock to help our energy needs. So throughout the early 70s, there were basically uh, high rates of inflation, the government capped public sector pay rises, and it caused unrest amongst the trade unions and workers. And in the middle of 1973, we had uh, a beginning of a work to rule by the mining uh, industry. Coal stocks dwindled, and that, together with a second double whammy, if you like, a second whammy that hit us at the time, was that in 1973, um, OPEC raised the oil prices. And if you remember from two slides ago, 90% uh, of our dependence in energy needs in terms of keeping the economy running, cars running, the lights on, was from coal and oil, oil imports, because this was prior to um, the North Sea taking off. So people like me, I'm old enough to remember, uh, were working uh, on homework with candles. Uh, we had what was um, known as the, the three-day week at that time. It was actually the three-day work order it came into force at midnight on the 31st of December in 1973. While some services that were deemed essential, hospitals, supermarkets, and newspaper print runs were exempt, the impact was absolutely dramatic and catastrophic for the UK. There was a, a, a desperate attempt during the crisis to conserve energy. Uh, for those of you that Watch the TV. The TV was uh, ceased broadcasting at 10.30 in the evening uh, and household domestic supply was, was cut off so that people were working um, by candlelight. 
the three-day week, the early 70s. Then geoscience rose to the rescue. It rode to the rescue with the acquisition, processing, and interpretation of seismic data. Together with the drilling of wells, it was possible to open up the North Sea. And hydrocarbons are plenty in the North Sea Basin. This is uh, Tony Benn in the centre here, turning on the taps in 1975 for the first oil to come on shore from the North Sea province. We'd already had gas supplies, both from the Irish Sea and from the Southern North Sea, but just 18 months after the three-day week was enforced, oil started to flow from the basin into the UK. This is the situation today. The North Sea and other parts of the UK CS, the UK continental shelf, have major sedimentary basins in which oil and gas reserves are, are preserved. So in here on the left-hand side, you see all the major fields and pipelines that bring those largely gas in the southern North Sea and oil as well as gas in the northern North Sea ashore, as well as gas from um, here in the Irish Sea and down here in southern England, also oil around the Witch Farm area. After 50 years of exploration, we know these play fairways relatively well. And what we can, we can show here is here is the oil province with its major source rock, which is a Jurassic reservoir called the Kimmeridge um, Shale. It's actually outcrops at Kimmeridge Bay down here in, in Dorset. And in the Southern North Sea and Irish Sea, we have a different source rock, which are the Carboniferous Coal Measures, the very same coal measures that supplied the, the, the coal that I was referring to before um, for some of the energy supplies. Here, they're buried and they're buried to enable methane gas to be matured and to be reservoired in overlying and, in, in some cases, interdigitating sandstones of Carboniferous Age. So oil and gas play fairways were discovered and went on to supply our oil and gas needs um, for the best part of, of 25, 30 years with, with um, no, no issue or no problem. And as a result, we went from an energy dependence upon coal and oil. So this is the earlier diagram you saw, now extended through to 2012, showing how coal, the, the, the amount of coal that we've been using to have a total energy, I'll come back to electricity as opposed to total energy, and what oil has done over that time. So you can see that at the present day, oil and coal are probably making up around 50% uh, of that um, particular uh, graph, and then gas, gas that was coming from the North Sea primarily in the early years, and the Irish Sea uh, also makes a significant contribution, but that's nuclear in yellow, and hydro, um, so uh, hydroelectric plants, and then in green, renewables actually make up a relatively small amount. So we have gone from a sort of coal dependence, if you like, to coal and oil dependence, to coal, oil, and gas dependence as we've gone through from here in 1965 through to 2012. But whilst we have a mixed energy balance, it's still one that's dominated by fossil fuels. Now this is quite an interesting uh, graph as well because this shows the total energy for electricity alone. So the last one was everything that we need to, to fire up Steve's car and to fly our planes and so on. This one is just simply, effectively, the electricity from the grid. Uh, and I'll talk you through this as well, from 1970 through to 2012. At this time, most of the coal, which is making up over 50% of our electricity needs, the national grid needs, was actually coming from the UK. You can see at this point, it was dropping. This is after the second um, coal mining strike, and the, the, the closure the progressive closure of uh, coal mines through this period. Now, in here it stabilizes, so in fact, UK coal goes down like this, and there's only one coal field currently um, operating, uh, but there is still a need for some coal imports to make up the overall energy balance with our coal-fired power stations. So um, the arrest in this decline is actually when imports of coal started to rise from Poland and elsewhere to ensure that the energy needs of this country were met. At this point, you can see the oil-fired power stations are being switched off and being replaced by gas-fired ones as we use our plentiful supply of, of natural gas from the Irish Sea and the North Sea. 
Nuclear runs along through here, increasing and then diminishing. And this is the beginning of the renewable industry, making up the, the, the top part of this, this graph. But you can see that, albeit a mixed energy uh, supply, it's still dominated by um, fossil fuels. This is quite an interesting um, graph as well, because this shows the electricity mix for um, last year. It's worth stressing that two-thirds of the energy that we used for electricity in this country last year came from coal and natural gas. Two-thirds of our energy needs to keep the lights on came from those two sources alone, fossil fuels. A remaining 21% came from nuclear. So 87% of our needs for electricity came from those three sources. And as you can see, renewables, albeit growing, and other sources are uh, beginning to make headway and becoming increased, but they are still relatively uh, small proportion of our uh, needs to keep the electricity going. This is a supply in a typical week, and I've deliberately chosen February 2013, and you'll see why when I go on to talk about March 2013 and what happened in that particular month. So, let me talk you through this first. What we see here in a typical week is that demand, this is each day of the week here, demand is, is higher of an evening than it is during the, the early hours and, and uh, sort of waking hours than it rises. Um, and we see this fluctuation. So demand higher in the evenings, drops overnight, and also is lower at weekends than it is during the working week. What makes up that energy source? There's nuclear, which is relatively constant. We have in here um, coal, making up in, in the blue, which makes up a substantial part of that energy mix. Wind, which is there in the, the purple color, is a relatively minor uh, contributor. But look what gas does. Gas is the red, and it accommodates the swing in demand. It's basically what allows us to have extra security of supply, the, the, um, uh, the, the comfort blanket, if you like. If everything else failed, as long as we've got gas, we're in, in good shape. At the bottom here, I've put this, uh, you, you can go to the web and, and have a look at this if you, you just type in um, the national grid. It will bring up the a speed dial, as you see here. And what I've done here is to take one from, from earlier today, and it basically shows 39% of our electricity needs is coming from coal, 25% from nuclear, 12% from gas, and um, 13 for wind. This makes 90%, 10% from other sources. And this was for um, the early hours of this morning in one of those low points. So you can go and have a look at the, 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 what... Uh, contribution is made from each different um, uh, source in this regard. But gas accommodates the swing. Now this is a graph showing gas demand for the decade 2004 through to um, 2014. What it shows is the relative contribution made by various gas sources, so this is only the gas now, uh, including the UK contribution. Now look back 10 years ago, the UK was contributing probably 80% of the gas needs that we had for this country. I should explain that highs are the winter months, low are the summer months. Now what we see here with the blue is it's declining. This is the decline in gas supply from the United Kingdom's continental shelf. Gas supplies have been declining steadily and progressively, such that from 2010 onwards to present day, UK is now a net importer of gas. We are reliant upon gas from other sources, from other countries, in order to satisfy the overall demand that we have. That UK gas is only making up something like 25% um, of this need now. A while back, back uh, a year or two ago, it was about 45%. Now, you can notice that in red, we've got other contributors coming here. Direct import from Norway. Almost a third of our gas that comes in to um, supply the demand that we have in this country comes from one um, gas field in uh, Norwegian waters. It's called Orm Ormenlanger. In addition to that, we've got other imports from other sources. We've got imports of uh, LNG, that's uh, liquefied um, natural gas. 
That's important, as you'll see in a minute, for what happened in uh, 2013. So we're highly reliant upon sources from overseas to keep the lights on in this country. So this is where our gas comes from. We've got less than uh, half of it is UK sourced, over half of it from other sources then. 45% was domestically produced in 2012. Almost a third of it comes from Norway, from one single gas field. If that gas field failed, that pipeline failed, we would not get a third of our gas. We have 10% of sources coming from continental Europe. And we have, importantly, 15% of gas coming in to Milford Haven with the LNG plants, for, largely from Qatar. What could go wrong? Well, March 2013 was a game changer. This shows the high mean and low mean of temperature um, during 2013. Look at the low, this is the, the mean average over previous years, but this is the actual. And in March, we dipped. You see that? The, the actual temperatures dipped by over three degrees lower than they should have been at the, the, the lowest point of the, um, the average. So in March 2013, we had uh, a crunch, really. There was quite a difference in Brighton in a year. This is the same day in 2012. This was in 2013. The sea froze over. Uh, it, was, it was a particularly uh, cold month. It wasn't just here for the UK, but the whole of uh, continental Europe and Eurasia, if you like, were far below in their temperatures than they um, would normally be expected to be. That spread down into France and into Central Europe. So demand was much higher over a much larger area. There were pressure points, pinch points on many of the pipelines. And as you saw before, we're reliant on um, overseas gas in terms of keeping uh, the lights on in this country. So as the UK shivered, uh, there were some very worried politicians. Politicians don't like lights going on while they're in, in um, power. And they took uh, an extraordinary interest in an LNG tanker that was making its way slowly and exibly across uh, to Milford Haven because the countdown was on, and you may not know this, but we were just six hours away, the UK, from being plunged into darkness because we were running out of gas. These are quotes, direct quotes. If it had run any lower, it would have meant interruptions to supply. If you go to Hansard, they actually count down, and then the, the, the it's a, oh, it's okay, it's here, it's arrived. Um, the combination of bitterly cold weather and the pipeline failures and the pressure in the whole system was such that we came in the UK that close to the lights going out in the way they did in 1973. So, Perhaps, perhaps it's no coincidence that uh, from March of last year, if you cast your mind back, uh, on TV, on radio, on, uh, in newspapers and so on, shale gas or fracking, hydraulic fracturing, became on each and every one of our radar in a much more uh, obvious way than had been the case before March 2013. So I'm going to perhaps go into a little bit uh, of why that is the case. However, we are where we are now. We haven't got shale gas. We haven't got other sources. So uh, people are putting out warnings. They're sometimes a little bit hidden away. But here it says, Britain faces blackouts within three years as power, sh power stations are shut. And... Uh, as we try to meet some of the targets for um, green energy, as we quite rightly should, um, it has a knock-on effect to some of those older, um, particularly um, coal-fired power stations and the generation of uh, electricity that, that is brought to market to serve our needs. Then there are events. Last month, Didcot B, so this uh, power station here on the left, which is um, a gas-fired gas power station, uh, burst into flames in October 2014 and was closed down. Had that happened in March of 13, we'd have been in real trouble. It's now up and running, but only at half its capacity. On the right-hand side, 
as you may have uh, also seen in the, in the press recently, Milford Haven, a refinery, is set to close. Interestingly, this was a refinery that was exporting largely oil and gas products to the USA. But there isn't any demand there now because of shale gas um, extraction that the US has actually built up uh, a capacity so it could be a net exporter. It takes away the market from Milford Haven and hence it's closing. But the UK spare capacity as a result of not just events but everything that's happened over the last 20 years or so means that we are at an all-time low at the present time. But this isn't actually just the UK problem. Global population growth and the demands for energy and improved living standards also place additional pressures upon the energy supplies. To give you a sense of scale, the world's population will have tripled from 3 billion in the 1960s to 9 billion in 2050. What will that do? Well, it's equivalent of adding a new city of a million people every week for the next 30 years. Very, very sobering. What does it mean in terms of global energy outlook? So Shell and other companies do scenarios looking forward on the demand growth over the, the course of the next 40 years. What this diagram shows is that effectively we will have an increase because of the population growth and the demand for better standards of living. There will be an increase on our energy demands, not a lessening of them. They're predicted to increase by something of the order of 60% over that period. And if you look at what makes up the majority of that, unfortunately, renewables isn't keeping up, keeping up the pace with the demand. It's still oil and gas that are making up the vast majority. Hydrocarbons are set to dominate the outlook. Gas demand is likely to double over that period. So given, given the challenge, both globally and in the UK, what are we going to do about it? Is the future unconventional? After all, doesn't it work in the USA? Unconventional in this instance is basically talking about shale gas or shale oil extraction. So I want to give you a, a more uh, a sort of sober tale here of the difference between UK and US geology. Because in the US, shale gas and shale oil extraction have worked but for three important reasons. There's the geology, there's the setting and the scale, and thirdly, the social license to operate. There are big differences when we come to the U UK, as you'll see. The first difference is that in the USA, the main sedimentary basins all that, that have shale gas and shale oil associated with them are sitting in the middle of a stable cratonic plate, a tectonic plate, away from plate margins. It's the first difference. They are at their maximum depth of burial today. So effectively what we're doing in these areas with the main plays, be it the Marcellus here, the Wilcox down in the south, the Bakken up in, in uh, Dakota, is that we're drilling into gently dipping geology, which is at its maximum depth of burial within what's called the oil or the gas kitchen area. There's also a lot of open space and a history in America of drilling. Uh, and I mean, I, I went to Pittsburgh a couple of years ago and it was transformed in 10 years from what was effectively a, a, a rust town at the end of, of heavy engineering and so on, in decline, very, very uh, difficult times for local population. When I went back a year or two ago, it was a, a booming, uh, almost yuppified um, city that absolutely transformed by uh, shale gas. This is the uh, process that we're talking about, uh, d drilling, uh, both vertical and then horizontal wells and accurately steering them into gently dipping, largely undeformed beds. So in effect, one is drilling straight into the oil or gas uh, kitchen area. And the simple geology makes it easier for drilling, steerage, and indeed 
production in these particular areas. So I'm only talking here about the geology, not about the environmental impact or consequences, and I'm happy to talk about some of those, those issues later too. But it has been done in the, in the US, and it has worked. My main um, purpose here is to say, is it going to work in the UK? Is it going to make the difference in the UK? And I'm going to just put my heart on a sleeve and give you my personal reflection on uh, the UK geology and try and talk you through why I think it won't work in the UK. It is not the politician's nirvana, in other words, to make up the difference for the gas supply that we, we are seeking. Britain is actually between the jaws of a vice. West of Britain, the Atlantic Ocean. Southeast of Britain, the Alpine ski resorts, the mountain belt. Between the Alps and the Atlantic, the sedimentary basins, which is quite a complex collage of basins highlighted in light blue, have been squeezed by the effects of both compression from the Alps and extension from the Atlantic. The Atlantic Ocean propagated through, sort of unzipped through this area between Greenland and the UK. We were attached to the pharaohs in Greenland until 55 million years ago. From 55 million years ago to the present day, the Atlantic has opened. Iceland has effectively formed over a, a mantle plume in the center of the ocean. And the other parts of the ocean have been like a conveyor belt extending apart. So we were on an active plate margin. And if we look at the geological map of the UK, courtesy of the BGS, more of them later, the oldest rocks are out here in Lewis and Harris. The youngest rocks are down here around uh, London and East Anglia. What's happened? Britain has done that. And we see older and older stratigraphy as we go from southeast to northwest, because Britain has tilted. And when did it tilt? Well, it folds sediments down here, which are very young, in geological terms, 35 million years. So from 55 to 35 million years ago, Britain tilted and was folded. And we have a number of basins sitting in this area being compressed. So what happens in this region? Let me take you to the Weald Basin in southern England. It's the, the, the sedimentary basin that lies between London and the south coast of England. It was a sedimentary basin that formed due to extension, had sediment laid down within it. But now, as many of you will, will be aware, the North Downs and the South Downs run around this basin and are arched up. So what I'm first going to do is to show you a north-south seismic line, which is effectively a 3D, or actually a 2D, body scan through the Earth. This is what it looks like. North to the right, south on the left. This is the South Downs, the North Downs. And what I hope you can see is a basin shape here. Th these sediments were being laid down and uh, subsiding. However, the green horizon here, which is the base of the Cretaceous, would go over the top and back down here. This is actually where the chalk is. And that's domed in a, into an anticline. So this basin has not only extended and been subsided, but it's been pushed back up into compression. You may remember that the Weald Basin is where the Balkan uh, well was um, intended to drill in this area with Codrilla for shale gas. So I just want to take you through a little bit of the history of, of this particular basin. So this is the basin forming and uh, subsiding. And as we go through geological time, everything is, is fine. It's getting deeper and deeper. We're maturing those potential source rocks. And then around 55, 60, 55 million years ago, oh, hang on a minute. The basin is being squeezed, uplifted, and then it starts to be eroded down by um, geomorphology to leave the two uh, north and south downs. And this is the, the depiction of that seismic line that you saw before at the present day. So we can, we can look at that seismic line, and then we can simply run the, the, the restorations through time. Al Fraser, Imperial, and others have looked at the evolution of this basin, how it's subsided, reaches its maximum depth of burial, and then gets uplifted as soon as the Atlantic Ocean opens, gets eroded down. And we've brought those source rocks 
back up towards the surface. They are no longer in the kitchen area. They're no longer generating hydrocarbons at the present day. Here are the restorations then at the top. This is showing present day. That's 30 million years ago. That's 60 million years ago. So in my contention, shale gas might work here, but 60 million years ago. We're, we're 60 million years too late. It's been deformed, it's been uplifted, and the, the, the lateral continuity and simplicity of the geology has been affected by those compressional processes. I chose that example deliberately because of Balcom. I could have chosen examples from other sedimentary basins around the UK, including the Boland Trough that, that uh, others are, are looking into, which incidentally underwent two phases of compression and uplift, one at the end of the Carboniferous and another uh, in the Cenozoic. So we can, we can think about drilling onshore. We can, we can look at areas like this one, pristine heathland near... Um, Pool Harbour, the largest onshore oil field in northwestern Europe, lies underneath this, and very few people know or see any effect. In fact, that's the rig, the workover rig. And horizontal wells were drilled out from this under um, Bournemouth Bay, and the world record of horizontal drilling for a number of years was drilled from this rig, which was tilted to set up an angle for 10 kilometers out to um, the east. So whilst horizontal wells have been drilled, onshore drilling has been going on for 60 or 70 years without a major impact on the, the environment, at least in, in Dorset. What we have to remember also with shale gas is just the, the amount of hardware and water and equipment that's needed. Is there anywhere in the UK that will, will actually uh, permit this sort of traffic to go through, let alone the impact that it has on local communities um, by the amount of, of pipe you need? Because in, in fracking, what you do is you drill a well and then uh, you, you, you cause it to, to fracture the rock around and take the gas from it but it depletes very quickly. So you have to drill another one, another one, another one. Every time you're bringing in more and more of the pipe, needing the water supplies in order to keep the whole operation going. Is rural Britain really ready for that invasion? Now, these protesters are protesting about other issues in terms of the integrity of, of the water supply, the chemicals that are used and so on. What I'm arguing on the basis of is actually the, the geology and the social license to operate with the traffic and, and the pipelines and the like that are needed. And I think where we've got to in this country is a very po polarized debate. And what really needs to happen is to, to, to communicate and understand some of the issues about, well, we are short of gas. Are we going to keep the lights on? How are we going to do it? Is this going to do it for us? If it's not, what are we going to do? And uh, this was a report that came out on the 12th of November, and it, it appears that others agree that indeed that there is a very much a shale gas hype um, going on at the moment. So if not fracking to help us with the um, electricity problem, what about nuclear or renewables? What about conventional resources? And how does exploration geoscience contribute to this discussion? So let's have a look at forward projections of future sources of energy. And, and here is renewables um, as it currently is, making up um, about one-sixth of our uh, contribution. And you can see that renewables, the use of them for energy supplies is going to increase and approach 50%, but not actually quite reach that. Nuclear remains pretty constant. Here is gas largely imported as the North Sea depletes. More and more gas will be brought in from, from um, elsewhere by LNG or, or, or pipelines from Norway and so on. And here is coal just uh, diminishing to um, little. Uh, and some of that is to meet Kyoto targets and the like. And unless CCS comes in, which is in this bit here, um, we're lagging behind in terms of actually showing a demonstrator and getting that rolling. We had an opportunity about 10 years ago with the Miller field to do that, a field with oil in it and CO2 in it. So it's proven that it holds the CO2 in there. And the opportunity was there to put more CO2 in to help uh, our admission, emissions into the atmosphere. 
but also to get more oil out, an extra 50 million barrels in the case of Miller. That did not happen. That particular project didn't happen, and we have limped along since with no actual demonstrator. There are a couple of projects, the White Rose Project and GoldenEye in the North Sea that Shell are, are driving that might get us started somewhere in here in 2017 and beyond. But without that, coal is going to diminish. Without the CCS, we're not actually going to be meeting our, our Kyoto targets and the like. So this is the look forward. So what about conventional exploration then? First of all, what is it? And then what contribution uh, can it play as we look forward? Most of the large fields in the North Sea were identified very early on. Uh, here what we see are cross sections across the North Sea showing the tilted fault blocks and hydrocarbons being light migrate up into shallow levels. So actually interpreting, identifying and interpreting on these earth body scans, if you like, where the reservoir might be, where the hydrocarbons reside. And if you blow up an area like that, that's what you see. Two major reservoirs coming up with um, gas and an oil cap within it against the, the big tilted fault. And here is the unconformity, the erosion surface over the top with sediments that laid down uh, above that. So as the basin subsided, it gets to its greatest depth of burial. The source rocks in these level then mature and hydrocarbons fill and spill, fill and spill up through all of these structures. So this is conventional exploration within the North Sea. And the subsurface mapping that was undertaken, so if you map a surface like this from its low point to its high, to its low, to a high, you can start to produce maps of the subsurface over a large area. And that's what this is on the right. Um, this area here, the red box, is equivalent to the red box here. Uh, this is a scale of 50 kilometers. So that's about 250 kilometers by 300 kilometers. And there is one of those body scan seismic lines every 12 and a half meters. There's a 3D volume over this area. So you're actually seeing a submerged, buried landscape made up effectively of islands and faults. It's almost like the Caledonian Jurassic McBrain um, archipelago of the northern North Sea, where you could, you could island hop between Snora and Vesund, and this would be uh, Goldfax, and then we go Statfjord, Brent, this is Ninian, over to Turn, Ida, and up to Magnus. All the major fields, all the major oil fields shown here in green are the highs, the warm colours. The blue, the cooler colours are where the source rock is mature, and hydrocarbons are migrated up along the faults, which are in shade, so the, the sun has effectively been shone from top left to bottom right towards me, so anything in shade is where you have a major fault. The larger the shadow, the greater the throw. The warm colors are the highs, the blues the low, the blacks the faults. We can map the subsurface really, really well now. Those big structures were drilled early. So in the early years of the North Sea, there was a drastic ramp up uh, at of reserves that were found, discoveries made and reserves. And this is the production profile that took place between 1965 and 2011 over that period. But notice how the reserves are tailing off as we drill smaller and smaller structures. Production is also on the wane. Now this is oil and gas production for the UK. So on the left hand side, I've tried to do these at the same scale. On the left hand side shows the ramp up. So here we were, three-day week, 1973. 1975, we turn on the oil. The gas came on a little earlier. It reached a peak, declined. A second peak, which was in 1999. And from that time, in 1999 to the present day, over the last 15 years, we have seen a dramatic, a sharp decline in oil production and gas production from the UKCS. It's this, this rather colourful um, slide is the production from each and every single field. And in the early days, you can see that there, there are a few colours producing a lot of oil. With the exception of that orange one, there are a lot more smaller fields producing oil. And that one there is called buzzard. When the buzzard field actually had a pipeline issue, we, we felt that in terms of the supply into the UK. So much reliance is on one field um, in terms of large volume, all the rest are making up the majority. But the overall 
um, decline is really, really dramatic, as you can see here. So production in sharp decline. Something else is happening in the North Sea. Costs are rising very, very sharply. This means that the number of wells that are being drilled is extremely low. In fact, there were fewer wells drilled last year in the North Sea than at any time since it was first discovered 50 years ago. Reach the peak here. This is us last year. Number of exploration wells at an all-time low. So if you don't drill a well, you don't find oil. If you don't find oil, you don't have production. We're not drilling any wells. There isn't production coming into the funnel for five or ten years' time. Without exploration success, let alone drilling the wells, we cannot arrest production decline. So what can we do? This is where the all-important role of geoscience, of geology, comes into it. The use of technology and innovation, what I, I would refer to as forensic geoscience. We have to use all the tools available and, and, and all the skills and have the talent pool of, of students coming through that understand how to utilise and impact uh, using the, the, the techniques. There have been significant advances in a number of areas. Subsurface imaging, amplitude extraction, which I will highlight what that is, Something called 4D time-lapse, which is where you can subtract one of my body scans from another and see how the fluids have moved and what's left behind and then target that. So targeted drilling. There have been a lot of advances in our ability to deviate a well, to look for those um, pools of oil or gas that have, would otherwise have let, been left behind. This is the improvement in the body scan from what was just a few years ago to a discovery made on the basis of these types of data. This is actually the largest oil discovery in the last decade, and it's been um, largely driven by a company called London, who did some very clever exploration, as well as having better um, technology uh, and improved seismic techniques to make that discovery. Largest discovery in Norwegian waters um, in the last decade. We can go to... Oh, it's got something gone on top of this, but if you just look at the top one, uh, we can go to the Southern North Sea and see an, an increase as well in the ability to image the subsurface. And in this case, this led to a well being drilled here into a very, very narrow, poorly defined target um, that previously had been drilled as a success, but now could be drilled with a lot more um, focus and attention to it. And this has become the WYSI gas field, the first field to produce from Zechstein carbonates in the Southern North Sea. And as I, I'm sure you agree, a beautiful um, image at the top there for uh, how to uh, interpret some of the structural geology uh, and these faults. And these are the same faults, actually, that reactivated in the wheels that I, I showed you before, but in the Southern North Sea. Now, let's, this is going to test the technology, but I thought what I'd do is show you a couple of volumes of data um, so that I know what I've got to do. I'm going to go to the right mouse and go to that. Now, what you can do as a, an interpreter now is run through a whole data set. And so basically, either dice it or potentially also slice it. So let me just see if I can set this one off. This is going horizontally through the Earth now, looking at layer after layer after layer through it. And within this, we can start to map features, folds. There's one coming through here. And keep an eye on this. There we are, fold coming through here. This is actually an oil field. It's called Beatrice. And so we can now use very sophisticated, a bit like the medical profession, really, uh, sophisticated methods to start to understand the subsurface of the Earth. That was not available to, to me when I started out. It was all 2D paper and, and crayons and, and mapping. Now it's fantastic that we, we have these uh, much more closely spaced volumes and can understand the subsurface of the Earth and actually understand Earth evolution much better from using these processes. So here's another example from um, an area of the North Sea where we can, we can map a whole series of faults and, and produce this, this rather dramatic staircase um, from a high here, the warm colours going down into the basin. And this is the staircase along which oil and gas migrates to fill and spill and fill and spill along its migration pathway. We can also use both field analogues and uh, bathymetric studies, marine geoscience, sort of thing Doric um, uses in, in terms of looking on marine cruises, IODP and so on. And this is a, a model west of Shetland um, of uh, effectively a submarine fan complex, so sea level would be up here somewhere. 
And what we can do is, is interpret from field studies what we would expect to find in different parts of these areas, going down into the lower part of thin-bedded turbidites and the like. And amazingly now on seismic data, we actually image such things. And we can make very detailed three-dimensional forensic geoscience maps of the subsurface. So um, this is a case in mind on uh, the bathymetry. So this is interpreting a horizon from seismic. And then down in here, you see these bright spots. These are actually sand-filled channels, which are buried at depths of two to three kilometers that are being revealed for the first time by using these seismic techniques. Now, with detailed drilling into these particular features, it's possible then to, to target and extract hydrocarbons in a way that would otherwise not prove possible, particularly if you only had a 2D spaced grid across this line. We can image complexity of, of the like that we could not imagine 25 years ago. These are examples from um, the North Sea, where this is one of our tilted fault blocks with faults and material that has degraded and broken and gone out into the basin. So up to this point, it's very simple geology. So if I was to shine the light from left-hand side of the room where, where Steve is towards me, that would be in light, and then it would go in shade. Light, shade, light, shade. That's what you see on the right here. Up until this point, up until that point, everything is simple. And all these uh, platforms for hydrocarbons, this is actually the Brent field, all these were drilled in the simple geology. The difficult geology was left for another day. But as hydrocarbons were extracted from this, more and more was being left behind within these complex slump zones. Now with drilling technology, together with this type of technique, we can not only image the complexity, we can target it and get the oil out of it. So many companies, what they do now is to use immersive technologies, what's called a hive, a highly immersive visualization suite or environment, and one of these smart rooms where they're, they're actually supporting and monitoring wells and assets in real time with all the data coming in um, uh, to one place at one time. It's all, all well and good having this equipment and having a lot of sort of uh, relatively uh, late stage career folk working in this industry but we also need skilled technicians that are coming in at the front end and also consider this to be an interesting and exciting area to come into. There's certainly a challenge there. The demographic challenge can be highlighted here. This is um, a graph that the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers produced on the number of geologists, their age distribution in the US. And you can see it's moving it's moving towards the right, and the peak here is of people that are 50 years old or greater. And you can see there's a sort of tail here. And as that lot shuffle out to the right into the rest home, um, we haven't got enough supply coming through of people that either find this interesting or are challenged by it. Uh, there's, there's a bit of a crew change needed and a demographic gap. We're losing proven oil finders. We're not replenishing the funnel with, with people coming in. So what's Herrick Watt trying to do in this regard? The role of applied geoscience is vital. I hope I've been able to demonstrate that. Uh, Shell have supported the setup of this facility. That is the Shell Center for Exploration Geoscience with uh, PhD and postdoc students attached to it. Secondly, what we're doing as a university is that we're teaming up and collaborating with the British Geological Survey. I mentioned them before, the map that I showed. And what we're doing is we're setting up the Sir Charles Lyell Centre of Earth and Marine Science and Technology. And I'll talk a little bit about that before closing. And finally, as Steve mentioned right at the outset, the Research Council, Nat Natural Environmental Research Council, backed our bid, a winning bid, uh, in a competition to set up the UK Centre of Doctoral Training with a collaborative partnership around the UK to train, to train the next generation of PhD students in this challenge. But not just for oil and gas extraction, all the way through to environmental regulation, impact and sustainability. So that's what we're doing. Here is the uh, Shell Centre as it, it was uh, a year ago when it was instigated with some of the students. There's Steve there, uh, Kerry Powell, who you hear from a little later, Steve and Kerry here signing the uh, agreement. The Lyle Centre, that is a new geoscience hub 
the collaboration between the British Geological Survey and Heriot Watt University. It is supported by the Research Council and also by the Scottish Funding Council. So those two bodies together with Heriot Watt and the BGS have come together to make a 20 million pound investment in the main centre, the Lyle Centre, and a support building that will house the marine capability, marine science Scotland capability here. Who is Sir Charles Lyle? Uh, he was the most uh, eminent of geologists in his day in the early part of the 19th century. He was the person, as I'll show in a second, that linked earth and marine processes, understanding marine processes at the present day and what they told us about the, the rock record and earth processes deep hidden beneath our feet. He also, for those of you that are sort of Herit Watt minded and, and historians of the university, he also married a lady called Mary Horner, who happened to be the daughter of Leonard Horner, the founding father of Herit Watt University, and coincidentally, also a geologist. So it's geology coming home, really, uh, with the, the Lyle Center. And this is the Temple of Serapis, and that, by the way, is Sir Charles painting himself on the frontispiece uh, between the 8th and 9th editions of the Principles of Geology because he'd been sitting there many times and then realized most of his life's work actually was staring in, in front and was different than how he previously thought it would be. Always strong as a scientist if you change your mind when faced with new data. That's what Charles Lyle did and, he, and almost a, 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 taking a little bit of, of fun at himself, he painted himself on there as, a, as a, a salutary lesson that he saw these horizontal um, shoreline deposits made by a marine mollusk uh, called Lithophaga. There it is there on the modern example of Potsuwali. And what he realized that these Roman pillars had been built, had subsided beneath the waves for long enough that for there to be a shoreline and then come back up. So since Roman times, this wasn't something gradual or uh, uniformitarian, very slow moving. This was a process that had operated over the last 2,000 years that these columns had been down the way by several meters, were the shoreline, and then uplifted again. And he suddenly realized the link. He was sitting on top of a volcano. It's close to um, Vesuvius. And in Pozzuoli, this, this small town, just a suburb really of, of Naples now, of the conurbation, um, there's the Solfaterra and other uh, volcanic deposits. And what, what he was seeing, in, which was recorded here, was the fact of the beating heart of the earth, of the way in which the magma chamber beneath his feet had collapsed, sea level had risen to get the shoreline, and then suddenly started to balloon again to bring the columns out of the sea. Earth and marine processes linked. So here is the Lyle Center, and courtesy of, of David and Malcolm and others from uh, Buildings and Estates here, uh, that is the IPE Enterprise Oil Building, now part of the Energy, Geoscience, Infrastructure and Society School. That's here. This is the boomerang-shaped building that's going to start going up in, in January with the Heriot Watt and the BGS um, wings and the collaborative space highlighted in yellow. This is what it looks like in more detail inside. This is just showing some of the, the ground floor plans and the, some of the designs that, that we have for the collaborative space. This is what the building will look like looking in. It looks straight out towards uh, Edinburgh uh, Castle. And this is the support building that housed the marine capability. Final thing then, just on the skills um, shortage and what we're trying to do about that. Uh, the Natural Environmental Research Council uh, were driven by biz, business, uh, innovation and skills to put money into oil and gas. Funny enough, just after March 2013. So £2.7 million of investment was set aside for 10 four-year PhD studentships and the competition was match that. So Herit Watt led a UK-wide partnership and I'm really glad to say that we won the national competition and CDT was awarded uh, just under a year ago um, to us and our partners. And there are a number of partners. So uh, there are six core partners other than Herit Watt, Aberdeen, the BGS, Durham, Imperial, Manchester, and Oxford, and a further 12 associate partners. So effectively, we are the UK Collaborative Centre for Oil and Gas, all placed in, into um, 
combination and collaboration across the country. And um, very recently, the, the students that are doing the PhDs as part of this initiative came to Herit Watt. So this is a higher education institute and NERC affiliate investment of 5.7 million added to the NERC 2.3 to take us to 8 million pounds of investment in this area. That allows us to support 31 four-year PhDs in each of the next, starting in each of the next three years. So 93 PhD students. In addition, nine companies have now come in and invested a further million pounds with a view to that rising to 2.4 million pounds over the course of the, the duration of the uh, CDT. They are supporting the Training Academy. And it was the Training Academy that was launched here on the 29th of October. So uh, less than a month ago with um, over 130 delegates coming to um, the James Watt Center. And then just, crikey, when was this? Monday before last, uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, Alistair Carmichael, uh, called in to uh, meet all the students. Here they are, the first cohort of uh, PhD students as part of the CDT. Uh, Steve is in here somewhere, there he is standing proud. Alistair Carmichael is hidden a little bit uh, behind. And quite properly, all the students uh, prominently in the foreground. So, I'm mindful of time. Um, what I hope I've been able to do is to give you quite a rapid run through of the historical and geological context of the UK energy and electricity supplies. I hope what I was able to do is take a look back and look at the energy crisis of the early 1970s, the three-day week, the impact, the positive impact that the UK CS's oil and gas has had on the economy, on the electricity supply, on energy in general. But we are where we are. We've got a current challenge and there's no getting away from it. Renewables is not making up the difference that we need to keep the lights on. Politicians and others are looking at different alternatives Fracking is one of them. I hope I've highlighted there are challenges, real challenges in geology, as well as the environmental impact of going down that route too far, too fast, too soon. Even if we did, and it worked, even if we did that, it's going to be a number of years before that, that came on, on stream. The testing has not been done. The geology, the science behind it, is, is not been, uh, been, been achieved yet. So that is the current challenge. That's the challenge that I leave with you and for the, 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 those that are coming through to research and train in this area. There is never a more important time now to, to actually engage in the debate between environment and oil and gas capability. And things like the Lyle Centre, the NERC CDT and the Shell Centre of Exploration Geoscience underline Herit Watt's vital role in this area and the importance in it, in getting that dialogue going and the communication started. Thank you very much for your attention.